Today, um, I'm first of all very happy to be here on stage. Uh, thank you for attending this session. So we'll take it a, a little bit differently than uh, some other sessions. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about uh, Toku World, uh, which is uh, the company I'm running in uh, Singapore. Just touch it briefly at the beginning. But the goal of today is to take a different approach and to look at okay, how dependent are CPAS players compared um, to the operators, actually. So we heard yesterday at the opening session from Andy himself, uh, he was standing at the edge of the stage claiming the death of uh, telcos and the death of carriers. So I wouldn't say I entirely disagree with him, but uh, there are some nuances that I would like to bring up today uh, in order to challenge maybe a little bit that uh, common saying here uh, at the API days that telcos uh, are done and that CPAS are here to replace them. So first of all, uh, I would be very interested to know in the audience uh, who is from which uh, side. So who is from uh, the CPAS world? Show of hands, come on guys. Ah, can't be so, so few. Operators? What? There are more operators than uh, CPAS players. Okay, very interesting. I was, yeah, I was not expecting that at all, actually. Uh, okay, very good. So, um, how do I fit myself uh, in that picture? Just uh, a quick uh, introduction about my journey towards uh, the telecommunication industry. So, I started off as an infantry officer uh, in the Belgian army. I did several missions uh, around the world, and after Afghanistan, I decided to uh, go into the private sector. I joined a boutique firm uh, for management consultancy, and at some point I made the move to expatriate to uh, Singapore, which I will mention in a second, um, in order to do all, every, every time uh, international project and change management uh, for IT initiatives of multinationals. So that was mainly my focus until I got the opportunity to um, take over a small uh, telco operator in uh, Singapore uh, that was not doing so well and that needed uh, restructuring. So I accepted the challenge and that's how I got into uh, the telecommunication industry and that I discovered a totally new world. So previously I was mostly uh, doing work in uh, the fintech and in uh, the financial sector, which was already uh, quite unbelievable when uh, you have actually a look behind the scenes at how things are working, where are the margins, uh, and what is the process like. Uh, once I arrived in the telecommunication industry, I discovered something that was uh, even a multiple of what banks are sometimes doing in order to deliver their services. So very interesting. And after the restructuring of um, the, the telco, uh, end of uh, 2017, I had the opportunity to do a management buyout uh, with the private equity fund, and that's how I started in April last year, uh, Toku World, uh, or uh, Toku. So that's how I went from uh, the uniform to the suit, and then now in a simple t-shirt and uh, jeans. So. Singapore uh, is important in the presentation I'm giving because, of course, as I'm not, as some of you, um, an, uh, someone that has a lot of experience in the telecommunication industry, I discovered it three years ago, um, a lot of my assumptions, a lot of uh, what I've been presenting, uh, or what I will present today, is based on Asia Pacific and uh, Singapore in general. So Singapore is an awesome location to do business. So if, if you have the opportunity to enter the Asian market, Singapore, uh, even more than Hong Kong, is, is strategically located in uh, the Asia Pacific space. So very good uh, to be there. Uh, they also have a neutrality. It's like the Switzerland of Asia. So everyone uh, accepts to do uh, business with you. The infrastructure uh, is uh, top notch. and. Uh, Overall, uh, it's, it's really a great place uh, to do business. But I'll give some examples uh, later on. So, the telecommunication industry, or at least the way I see it, uh, and I'm happy to have a debate after uh, the session. So first of all, uh, in terms of the background, what uh, strikes me uh, when I'm looking at the industry that has been built over several uh, decades, even centuries, is that the telecommunication industry has always been at the forefront of innovation. They have been the ones that uh, have introduced um, new technologies. Actually, they were present for most of the new technologies from the inception until the implementation and the business model. But somewhere around, along the way, uh, they got lost at uh, VOIP. So they managed to do it for the fixed lines, uh, for um, the, the fax, for the mobile phone, even for the satellite phones. And then came VOIP. They were the ones installing the infrastructure. But then 
they didn't realize that they could actually change completely the way the business was running. And we will get into that a bit later on. So first of all, um, a simplified value chain of how the telecommunication industry is articulated uh, nowadays. So I'm distinguishing here um, three categories. Uh, first of all, you have the telecom operators and the aggregators, which are the traditional players of the industry. Those that have uh, both a wholesale activity, trading connectivity and access services around the world. And at the same time, also an enterprise lag where they are directly serving uh, businesses. The CSP um, and, and CPAS, CPAS providers are for me more or less in the same um, branch even though I understand that, of course, CPAS is provisioning things very differently. And in the previous presentation, you've seen how um, CPAS can actually enable uh, older CSP uh, actors in order to also start to compete uh, with the CPAS players and to provision these uh, often mentioned uh, APIs to enterprise customers. But for the enterprise customers to have access to all these telecommunication services, you need um, some interfaces. So initially, it was always done through a system integrator, and actually the telecommunication industry as a whole um, is made up of thousands and thousands of actors with their own niche, their own specialty, um, their own investment, because to get access to telecommunication services, you need, uh, or you needed at the time, uh, a lot of infrastructure. It was an investment. Uh, you needed an expertise, and so, um, that's why there is such an ecosystem of many different providers. And that ecosystem is actually what is being challenged today. So the system integrators on one side, um, then the, the complete solutions, uh, or what we call now uh, UCAS, and then, of course, the application programming interfaces. Um, even though, uh, and I will come back on that at the end of the presentation, I think that most of the economy today cannot handle APIs. So what happened? Why um, was suddenly the, the CPAS player the, the one at the forefront and the one towards whom all the margin and the revenue is shifting? Or at least that's what everyone here uh, believes. So all the revenue and all the margin is shifting from the operators, the traditional actors, towards uh, the um, CPAS players uh, that, that are now connecting with the enterprises. Because one thing I forgot to say, the value chain is made up like this with the telecom operators at the bottom because when you're looking at the PSTN and at all the, the connectivity, it's still the operator that will deliver the core service. The CPAS player is provisioning differently and is enabling enterprises to access the service, but the end connectivity, the termination of the signal, enabling the communication to arrive to the right recipient, to the right device, that is done by the operator. So that revenue shift and that uh, margin shift, how did it come across? What happened? Well, disruption happened. And disruption, it's not so complicated. It's basically the collision of continuous improvement of something that exists and innovation on the other end. So it's literally a new business model or a new provisioning method that is replacing an old one. So what does it mean? Does it mean that operators were not able to detect Innovation? No, that, that doesn't mean that at all. Because actually when you look at a similar industry that uh, it has been disrupted lately, the bank industry, you have the fintech that came along as the new players, the one that are disrupting the whole bank industry. And telcos were quite rapid to embrace fintech. One of the examples is MTN in Africa with the, the cross-border remittance uh, through SMS that, was, uh, that is called M-Pesa. Uh, for, for them, they really embraced that innovation and the fact that FinTech was enabling them to activate a new business line. So they are capable, the operators are capable to detect innovation. The big difference with the example of FinTech adopted by uh, an operator is that you are creating a new business line. So you are generating new revenue. But here, in the case of CPAS players and the new provisioning model, you actually need to challenge existing business lines. So you will have to cannibalize yourself because you are going to replace a business activity that is working with another model. And cannibalization is always difficult. But as the common saying goes, if you are not ready to cannibalize yourself, someone else will do it for you. 
And that's exactly what C++ players have been doing. However, I would not uh, dismiss the carriers as fast as uh, some, some have been saying uh, over the past two days, because they have a lot of assets. And it's only the very beginning of uh, the disruption and the consolidation. So what are these assets? First of all, as I said before, the infrastructure that is carrying the service, so the underlying infrastructure, is still owned by the telcos. They are the one enabling you to deliver the core service that is still today voice and SMS. Secondly, you have the regulations. So some of the new players, like uh, the OTT players, when you look at the different communication channels that are available, they are today not regulated. Telcos are. You can see that as a limitation, but actually it is uh, an, an asset, especially in, in regions like uh, Asia Pacific, because in, in Europe the regulations have been uh, standardized across the different countries. So not only do you have these regulations that are not well known by the new digital providers and by the CPAS players, these regulations are often also shaped with the help of the telcos, because they have been in touch with the regulators for years now, decades. So certainly an asset in, in, in my view. And then the brand awareness. Uh, as Jean was pointing out in the previous presentation, most of the telcos still have a relationship with all these enterprise customers. And they are much better known than even the, the most famous uh, CPAS, which is uh, probably Twilio today. If you are testing it, even if the, in the domestic market of Twilio, you go outside and you ask 100 people uh, about Twilio, most of them will not know the brand, compared to AT&T, for example. Um, and if they know it, they will not for sure be able to tell you exactly what Twilio is doing. So we are still far away of having a brand awareness that is sufficient to enter a market and to go towards enterprise customers and directly convince them to go from their old provisioning method and their traditional on-premise PBX towards uh, a cloud communication provider uh, as uh, Twilio. So you have these assets, but also the timing is still very good for operators. Because the, the tech ecosystem is not going to change overnight. So of course, everyone wants to believe that in a few years, not so far from now, everyone will be connected to data. But that is simply not true. Um, most of the population in cities, yes. But as soon as you go outside of cities, that's no longer the case. Take the example of um, Indonesia. Indonesia, that's 18,000 islands. So I can guarantee you to have data connectivity when you are there, that's not an easy thing. Just having mobile connectivity and being able to do native calls is already an achievement. And you don't even have to travel uh, across the world to, to notice that. Just drive up from uh, the south of France to Paris, and you will have kilometers of highway where you have no data at all. Okay? And it's, the explanation is quite uh, logic. It's just that it doesn't make business sense to install data connectivity where the population density is too low. So that's the explanation for France. And then for the islands uh, in different emerging countries is simply the fact that it's very costly to do that in, in remote locations. Then secondly, the regional differences. So it's one thing to be successful and to thrive in the North America and in the European market, but it's very differently different once you get into uh, Asia or an emerging market. And many of the CPAS players like uh, Twilio, Nexmo, and others are realizing that when they are arriving in, uh, yeah, first Singapore, Singapore is still okay because it's so Western that uh, it, it, it's not so different. Um, but you already realize that there is another way of doing business. Okay? It's all about relationships. And uh, people don't like necessarily that uh, big sales machine that is uh, centralized in the headquarter in the US or in Europe. They like uh, local contact. They, they want to know that you understand uh, their business and their challenges. And so you need that local touch um, and you need to adapt simply to, to the country in which you are doing business. So it's not uh, one uh, recipe uh, for, for uh, all the countries uh, in the emerging markets. And then the fact that enterprises, well, they need more than APIs. As I said before, APIs today, many companies are not knowing uh, how to handle them. 
uh, let's let's assume that they already know what an API is, which is uh, the case 10% of the time when you meet with uh, a company. They don't know how to use it. And also, the organization of most companies is simply not adapted to that. They don't have so many developers because their business is traditional. It's brick and mortar. Of course, everyone is chasing all the same uh, animals, uh, the ride-hailing companies, the e-commerce uh, companies, uh, etc. But not the whole the economy is online yet. So you also need to have a solution for enterprises that are not able today to work with APIs. So that's how I want to transition to the fact that there is a lot of R&D that is done, and uh, then the adoption in the real economy. So we talked about uh, CPAS 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. I can tell you most of the economy is not even yet at CPAS 1.0. So in, in Europe, you have, of course, certain markets that are more advanced than others. I was discussing earlier with uh, integrators that were telling me that, for example, in the Netherlands, um, 80 to 90% of their implementations are today in the cloud. But when you take a market like Belgium, for example, or Germany, um, it's, it's not even half. So there is still a lot of need for on-premise implementation because the organizations are still structured that way. And the decision makers are also still uh, preferring to know where that server is located. And they also want to make sure that um, they serve a purpose. Because if everything is in the cloud, why do you need an IT manager in the company? So CPAS, uh, it's, it's of course great to have uh, such advanced evolutions and to already be at the web um, or, or enterprise suit uh, level. But you need to come back to the basics at some point. And that's where the operators have still a, a great value. Because don't forget uh, the, the common foundation of, of the talk here is the connectivity still belongs to the operators. You can do whatever you want as long as you don't have the infrastructure, the license, uh, and the access to the network with the range of numbers. You will need an operator or an aggregator in order to deliver the service that you provision so easily through uh, APIs. So also in terms of the target groups, I was mentioning earlier uh, the difference between the online businesses and the brick and market, uh, mortar companies. Um, and then, yeah, the tech savviness of uh, the decision makers. So something that we came across already a few times um, is the, the very different approach to a decision like what type of communication tool do I want internally? What type of communication tool do I want in order to address my audience? When you are talking to a tech company, so for those of you that uh, know Gojek, uh, for example, that's one of our customers in, in Singapore. And when we met with them, so a yeah, huge ride-hailing player uh, valued at several billions, billions of dollars, um, we, we talked Okay, can we, can we maybe have a meeting with your product team or with your um, tech team? Oh, no, no, uh, we are completely decentralized, so um, we are talking now with uh, the customer service department. We need a solution, we have a budget, we have the decision uh, power, so no need to talk to an IT. And the decision was taken very, very quickly. And the opposite, we, we went to a, a company that is in retail, uh, several offices uh, around Asia. They wanted to replace their on-premise PBX because they were about to move. And there, the process just to decide in order to go to the cloud was very long, was only driven by the IT, and it's at the end that we met with uh, the decision maker, the, the chief operating officer, in order to agree, okay, let's go for a Toku solution. So, Two different worlds, but when you look at the weight of these different companies, it's certainly the uh, centralized uh, IT procurement and the old-fashioned companies that are still um, making most of the economy turn. Okay? So, wh what is the forecast for the next 36 months? Because when you see that uh, there is such an opportunity for the operators to still wake up, they, something will happen. So first of all, there is an acceleration of the digital transformation process. And for that, the operators are definitely the, the best uh, place because they already have a relationship with the enterprise customers. Secondly, 
uh, at least in Asia, you have these uh, uh, smart nation initiatives uh, that are very advanced. Um, and in, in countries like Indonesia, again, where you have an average uh, age of uh, 30 years old, where most of the fixed lines have never been installed uh, to, the, to the whole territory, and that uh, most of the activity today is based on one super app, which is uh, Gojek, uh, the government needs to wake up and make sure that their services are also as much online. And so they are driving that same digital transformation process and they are pushing a lot in order to make sure that there is an adoption of um, not only APIs, but cloud communication services in, in general. And so as the industry is consolidating, because yeah, of course, operators are not going to look how CPAS players are taking away their lunch money, at some point, they have to react. And there is still a lot of time, huh? because the total telecommunication industry generates uh, more than $1,700 billion. And when you look at Twilio, which is uh, the highest uh, earner of the CPAS players, they are generating this year, on forecast, $1.5 billion. So still a long way to go before you go uh, and you play at the same level as a Vodafone or uh, an AT&T, just to give you a a comparison, Singtel, small Singaporean uh, player, they have a, a revenue of $8 billion with a net profit of 25%. Twilio generates uh, eight times less and is loss making. AT&T at the whole other end of the spectrum, yeah, they generate $170 billion. So saying that telcos are dead, it's way too early. What is happening though, is that telcos are one, starting to acquire solutions that are already built for them, like what uh, Telestax was presenting just before. So Telen, for example, in Indonesia, they have acquired the CPAS uh, platform of uh, Telestax. Others are developing it in-house, and what will happen in the next 36 months is a lot of acquisition. So operators are going to acquire CPAS players. And the opposite will be less um, easy to be done, the only player that might do that uh, at the moment is probably Twilio, as they have quite a lot of cash to spend. Okay? So basically, that's the conclusion, at least from my end, is that operators shouldn't be dismissed so easily, and that CPAS players, to be successful, have to partner up with operators, and the, the sooner, the better. So, interesting perspective. One quick question before we transition. Yeah. Why is the APAC so hot right now? Well, APAC has the advantage first that uh, there is a very young population, extremely tech savvy, so everyone is on mobile. Um, secondly, they are leapfrogging part of the technology. So as I was mentioning earlier, fixed lines have not been installed everywhere. So in order um, to, to install uh, cloud communication, when you, when you look at more traditional and older markets, um, you need to replace something that already exists. So automatically there is a friction because you are going to replace uh, some, some uh, businesses and, and some uh, revenues. And in, in uh, APEC, that's not the case. And their whole economy is growing so fast in general, it's double digits uh, in most of the countries in Asia Pacific, that automatically there is that boost to... to so it's the old to, greenfield play. Sorry? It's what we call the greenfield play. Mm. It's empty, it's fertile, and it's ready. We call it a greenfield play. Thank you very much. You're welcome.